All right, good morning. Today we should talk about uh, the biochemistry of the senses. So we'll talk about the molecular and cellular mechanisms that are behind our ability to sense the outer environment and possibly the inner environment as well, because we'll see that um, the mechanisms are actually very similar. Now, if we talk about senses, what do we mean by that? Or what can we mean by that? What senses do you know? Sight. Okay, sight, vision. Mm -hmm. Olfaction, okay, or in normal lay terms, smell, yes. Taste, mm -hmm. it's three, right? Mm. Hearing. Okay, yeah, hearing. That's four. Touch, okay. Any other senses? So those are the five, but. Hmm? Six yeah. <laughs> sense, what is it then? <laughs> okay, all right, okay, uh, sure. That's probably based on the, all the other senses and just maybe a different processing. But you may have heard about other kinds of um, modalities that we are able to sense. Maybe not necessarily towards the outside, but maybe towards the inside. There's proprioception, certainly. Pain, okay. Usually not put among the senses, but yes, it is a type of sensation, okay. And we'll talk about it very briefly. Discomfort. Discomfort? Just kind of general discomfort or, okay. Heat. Again, I think that's more of a complex feeling. Heat, heat. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, heat and cold, so temperature changes, absolutely. Even chemical, the chemical reception of the body. Very good, <clears throat> and there are actually very many uh, sensors for all sorts of chemicals inside our body, and again, we'll briefly mention that as well. Pressure, and what kind of pressure are we talking about? It's blood pressure, indeed. Very important sense for regulation of blood pressure. Yes. Osmolarity. Osmolarity, so osmotic pressure, etc., etc. So, so we can see actually that the number of senses really is much bigger than the, the usual five. Um, now, we're going to, well, actually, um, is there a way? through which we could divide the senses into groups based on the type, the modality that they sense, because there are actually similarities between these groups. Just think about how we could divide, the, let's say the five senses, but the other ones actually fit in there as well. How we could divide them based on the modality? Primary, hmm? Primary or secondary? Primary or secondary, okay. That's, uh, let's so say, the mechanism of sensation. Inside but. the body, you know. Sure, yes, if the, if the stimuli are coming from the outside or on the inside, yes. Yeah, okay, that's another way. But the, based on the, the um, how to say that? Based on the, the type of stimulus that... Yes, that, that, that's what I was looking for, okay. So maybe not necessarily mechanical, but we could say physical and chemical. Okay, so there are chemical senses and there are physical senses. Now, from the ones that we mentioned, which would be the physical senses that detect some kind of physical quantity or change in quantity? Vision. Yes, vision, indeed. Hearing, Hearing absolutely. Touch. Touch, of course. All the mechanoreception, so proprioception, etc., etc. Pressure, yeah. Yes, indeed, temperature, changes in temperature or differences in temperature, very good. So those would be the physical senses. And the chemical senses? Smell. Smell. Taste. Taste. And all the chemical sensors that we talked about are inside the body that detect the composition of the, um, of the inner environment. All right. So this distinction between the physical and the chemical senses is fairly important because you'll see that many of the, the mechanisms behind it are very similar for the chemical senses and very similar for the physical senses, but there, there are overlaps, as we'll see in a, um, in a second. Now, we will start talking about the, the molecular mechanisms of vision, of, of eyesight, um, 
Why vision? Why to start with vision? Well, it is actually by far the best studied sense that we have. We know almost everything about vision, while as, you, as we'll see, we know very little about some of the other senses. Okay. Why do you think it is that vision is so prominent, is so well studied? That's just, yeah. Okay, I'm not really sure that those numbers really work because actually there are many receptors, other kinds of receptors inside the body. But there is something about the, the visual, the photoreceptors that makes them very easy to study or relatively easy to study. Well, uh, you mean two types or? Okay, well, I guess that makes them relatively easy to study. Fair enough, yeah, okay. But from, from a very practical point, they're all in one place, right? They're actually very easy to find in the body because they are all in one place. And where are they? Where are all the photoreceptors? Retina. In the retina, okay? So that makes them very easy to study because you just use the retina and all the photoreceptors are there. Now imagine that you were supposed to study a, the touch receptors. Well, they are very difficult to find because they are all over the skin, right? They're, they're much, much harder uh, to study. So that's one of the reasons why vision is so well studied because it's just practically very easy uh, to you know, manipulate and study because it's all in, in one place and easily accessible from the outside. Um, but there is probably another more philosophical or whatever reason why vision is so well studied. Any ideas? Because we as humans really use vision a lot and it's one of, the, one of our primary senses really. We use vision much more than most other animals that use all the other senses and put the, you know, the, the image of the environment together from all sorts of senses. But we use vision really, really, really heavily. And I think that's one of the reasons why vision is so well studied because it's so important for us. But anyway, so let's start with vision. Now we already said what the, uh, what the organ of reception is, and that's basically the retina. So we could say the eye, but the eye, does all sorts of other things. It doesn't really detect the light, but the detector itself is the retina, and the photorecepting cells, the cells that are responsible for detecting a light are rods and cones. Now, you've done quite a bit, uh, or at least a bit, uh, about the, the structure of these cells and the structure of the retina, and you know that the retina is actually a fairly complex organ on its own, because in addition, to the photoreceptors, rods and cones, it also contains bipolar cells, amacrine cells, etc., etc. So actually, as we'll see in a second, the retina is not just the detecting organ, but it actually does quite a bit of the processing of the signal as well. So the retina is already an organ that actually processes a lot of the signal before it sends it into, into the brain for further processing. So it's a fairly, fairly complex organ, we could say, not just tissue, but it's really an organ. Um, but we won't go into too much detail on the processing. But anyway, let's start with the, with the photoreceptors. Now, as we said, there are two types. There are rods and cones. Um, the basic mechanisms behind the photosensation are pretty much the same, as we'll see in a second. But there are important differences between rods and cones. What are the differences? There are quite a few. Any idea? Okay, so rods are for black and white, okay, and cones are for color vision. But in fact, the individual cells, they don't see in color, right? They, they all just detect light. Either there is light or there isn't light. But you're right that with cones, we actually have three different kinds of cones that are sensitive to different parts of the visible spectrum. So the vision, the, the, the perception of color actually occurs in the brain. It doesn't really occur in the retina. But you're right that, that we, we have only one type of, of, of rods, but we have three types of cones depending on the, um, on the wavelength that they are most sensitive to. So correct, okay, and that's one of the differences. What other differences are there? Um, 
Sure. Mm -hmm. Very good. So while rods look something like this in a very schematic way. Okay, so this would be a rod and cones look something like this. Thereabouts, all right? Uh, but you've seen this before. I'm not telling you something new, right? <laughs> okay, some people are not entirely sure that they've seen it before, but, but okay. Um, okay, so th there are differences in the structure. And uh, while we are talking about the structure of those cells, what are these things inside that I drew inside? Because of course they are very, hmm? So they are disks, and what are they made of? Are they, really? Well, sort of, but what are those disks? Yes, they're, they're actually membrane vesicles or membrane disks, so they're deriv derivatives of the plasma membrane, and you correctly say that they contain the, the photosensitive pigment called rhodopsin. Now, what is the point of those disks? Why, why, I mean, most cells don't have any membrane disks in them. Maybe it's like for easier action potential propagation, like in the muscle cells or the tubule. Well, the thing is, in the rods, those disks are not connected to the, or, well, they're not connected electrically to the, um, to the plasma membrane. So it's, it's quite a bit different from the T-tubules. They increase the surface, right? Because the photosensitive pigment, rhodopsin, is a membrane protein. And we need huge amounts of this protein in the rod. So this is just a way, because if, if, the, if rhodopsin was only present in the plasma membrane, we couldn't actually fit as much into the cell as we can with those disks. So those disks are, are actually packed with rhodopsin. Around 50% around of those disks is actually rhodopsin. So when we say that there are derivat derivatives of membrane, well, they are, but 50%, at least 50% of them is protein, is, is rhodopsin, and there are other proteins there as well. So it's, it's just packed with huge numbers of those photosensitive uh, protein molecules. Um, and yes, and the point is really to increase the, um, uh, the surface area. In fact, if we just take this part of the cell, does anyone remember what the name of this is? Just of this part? This part, the outer segment, okay, the outer segment, the external segment. Um, only about 30% of the outer segment is cytoplasm. So 70% is actually filled with those membrane disks. Okay, so it's a huge amount of stuff there. Right, a similar thing is in, the, uh, is in cones, but here you can see that there are no disks inside the cell, but they're just invagination of the, uh, of the plasma membrane. But the, the purpose and the logic behind it is, is the same. All right? Good. Uh, okay, so structural differences. What are the, there are functional differences there as well. Any ideas? Well, the main functional difference between rods and cones is their sensitivity and their dynamic range. And when we sit here in sort of full light, which of these cells are we using to see? We're using cones. Why aren't we using rods? That is true, that is true. But if that were the only reason, we now would be using both rods and cones, right? So detect just, to detect just light and, and not light, we would be still using rods, and in addition, we would be using cones for color. But in fact, we're not using any rods at the moment. Do you know why? No. The re well, Rods are extremely sensitive to light. In fact, each rod is capable of detecting one individual photon of light. Okay, the sensitivity is absolutely incredible. 
Okay? Now, it may look like the cell is very, very small, so what is a photon? But actually, a photon is you know, many, many orders of magnitude smaller and many orders of magnitude less energy. So the fact that each rod is capable of detecting one individual photon, is, it's, it's an incredibly sensitive sensor. The downside of that is that if the light intensi intensity reaches a certain threshold, they become saturated. Okay, so basically they start giving off 100% signal. Okay, they b basically they just produce, there's light, and that's it. We can't detect any changes in intensity, there's just light. Okay, so in these, for us, normal daylight inten intensities, all the roads are completely saturated and they're useless. They're just giving 100% signal all the time. Okay, so we're not using them for vision. Basically the brain just filters the signal out because it's not useful in any way. Okay, so rods are extremely sensitive, but their dynamic range, so the, the difference between the minimum and the maximum intensity that they are able to detect, that they're able to distinguish, is actually relatively small. Cones, on the other hand, are not that sensitive. They are unable to detect individual photons. They're still fairly sensitive, but not as sensitive as rods. As, as rods. But they have very, very long, very wide dynamic range. So they are capable of distinguishing huge differences in intensity. Now, if any of you do any photography, you will know that, let's say, in a room, you know, at night or at dusk or whatever, we can see people normally and it feels, you know, when the, when the lights are on or whatever, we feel like there's plenty of light and we can still see. But if you take a photo, usually the sensor in the, or film, if you still use film, is much less sensitive. So, so it actually doesn't see that light. It feels like it's very dark in the photo, but we can see it perfectly normally. On the other hand, when it's sunny outside, the intensity of light is many orders of magnitude higher, and we still see it as normal light, right? We don't have a problem with it. Um, so this is why cones are so good for daylight vision, because they have very, very wide dynamic range. They can distinguish very broad um, uh, differences in intensity of light, okay? So those are the big differences, functional differences between the, uh, the two types of cells, all right? Now, of course, the color vision is part of it, but, but it's not really the main part of it. All right, so how does the perception of light actually occur? Now, we said that vision is a physical sense, so it detects a physical quantity, it detects light or light intensity or whatever. But actually, if we look at the mechanism, it's very close in its mechanism to chemical senses. Well, we said that the, the, the sensory protein, the actual photoreceptor, is called rhodopsin in rods, okay? And do you know what the name is for the cones? Yes, that's, that's a name that's often used. I prefer using photopsin. Well, there are three kinds of, three types of photopsins. Iodopsin, um, there seems to be a nomenclatural confusion about what iodopsin actually is. Okay, when you look in the literature, people use it for different things and it's very confusing because it feels like it contains iodine, which it doesn't, it's just a, okay. So I prefer not to use iodopsin, I prefer to use photopsin, which is the official name of all the cone photoreceptors or photorecepting protein. So let's use photopsins, okay? And there are three different kinds of photopsins depending on the wavelengths. Right, so we have rhodopsins, rhodopsin in the rods and photopsins three photopsins in cones. Now, all these proteins have the same mechanism and they actually have very similar structures. So they are membrane proteins, so they are all inside these disks or inside the, uh, the, the membrane invagination, so they are all um, membrane proteins. And in fact, their structure is very, very similar to G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so they belong in the group of G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so this is the relationship, this is the closeness to, as we'll see in a second, to all the chemical senses, which also are G-protein coupled receptors. In fact, and that's kind of going to the beginning of the, of the lecture, rhodopsin 
was the first G-protein coupled receptor ever discovered. Again, because there's a lot of it, and there's a lot of it in one place. So rhodopsin, the structure and the mechanism of, um, the mechanism of signaling of rhodopsin was discovered before any other G-protein coupled receptors were discovered. And in fact, the adrenergic receptors, which were the next ones, were discovered based on the structure of rhodopsin. So they started looking, well, is there something similar to rhodopsin in the genome? And they were like, oh, wow, there are some other receptors here or some other proteins. And they were like, okay, well, they're actually adrenergic receptors. And now we know that there are hundreds or at least, well, small hundreds, let's say, of different G-protein coupled receptors uh, in our body. So they are all G-protein coupled receptors and they share the same structural motive. So there are seven transmembrane uh, domains, et cetera, et cetera. But contrary to all the G-protein coupled receptors that we talked about last year, they contain their ligand inside them. So with other G-protein receptors, a ligand has to come from the outside, bind to the receptor and change its conformation. Here in rhodopsin and photopsin, the, the ligand is already there. It's inside the protein, it's actually covalently linked uh, to the protein. And the ligand is, it's retinal, it's retinal, it's the aldehyde, okay, uh, derived from, from retinol, which is vitamin A, okay. So retinol, the aldehyde from vitamin A, is the ligand inside. We could call it, if it was an enzyme, we could call it a prosthetic group, but it's, it's really a ligand for the receptor. And in its basic state, in the dark, when no light is present, it exists as its isomer, 11 cis retinol. So in the dark, <clears throat> when no light is present, Retinol is present inside rhodopsin and photopsin as this isomer, 11 cis retinol, okay? Which is unusual because the normal, the normal isomer is called all trans retinol. Okay, so this would be normal. So if we take vitamin A, Okay, it's all trans retinol. I'll draw, I'll draw the structure in a second just so that you can see, so that you see the difference. So this is a special type of isomer where the 11 double bond is actually different. I'll show you the structures because I think it's, you don't need to know the structures. I'm just gonna show you so that you can imagine the difference. I'll, I'll, all of them are trans, yes. All the double bonds that are in the molecule are trans, but it, it will become clear when I draw the structure. Again, this is not something you need to know to draw, but I think it's kind of instructive. So this is what 11 cis retinol looks like because this is the cis bond. You can see that all the other bonds are trans and this is the only one that's cis, okay? Now, I drew this weird thing here. What do you think that is? So we said that it's retinol, okay? It's an aldehyde. Why did I draw it this way? It doesn't have to be positively charged, but it usually is. But I'm sure that's something you've seen before. Well, this is the connection to the protein, to the opsin. It actually connects with lysine, which on its side chain has Lysine, side chain. <laughs> well, quite, yes, indeed. Okay, it has an amino group there. And amino groups have a tendency to react with aldehydes and form a structure called 
uh, shift base. Okay, so this is the shift base through which 11 cis retinol is connected to the protein. So it's covalently linked to opsin. Okay, now what happens when a photon of light comes in? Well, you can see here that there is, what, what, are, what kind of double bonds are they? Are they? I mean, they are transenses, but when you look at the structure, what kind of double bonds are they? Yes, they are between carbons. What about their spacing? Is there something about their spacing? They are definitely not like fatty acids, and that's the point what I'm asking. In fatty acids, they look different. In polyunsaturated fatty acids, they look different. In fatty acids, they are separated, yes, but not here. So when they're not separated by three, but by two, they're called. <laughs> There's something very special about these double bonds when they are just spaced by one carbon. They're called conjugated double bonds. And the conjugation, again, for the function is absolutely crucial. If they weren't conjugated, it wouldn't work. Because what happens is that the electrons in the conjugated double bonds are actually spread around the whole molecule. Okay? And this allows them to absorb photons of visible light. Remember last year when we talked about the synthesis of heme, we said that all the porphyrins, thanks to this large ring of conjugated double bonds, they are red. They absorb visible light. Okay? If they aren't conjugated, so before we get to the end of heme synthesis, they don't absorb visible light. They would only absorb ultraviolet light. Here it's the same thing. Thanks to the system of conjugated double bonds, retinol is actually red, okay, it can absorb light. Now when it is in opsin, it changes its absorption maximum, so it, it changes its color in a way, but it is kind of dark, violet, red, or whatever, okay? So, when a photon comes, it is absorbed by this conjugated system of electrons, and it excites the molecule, okay? The energy is absorbed. And this excited molecule can isomerize can change the conformation of its double bonds. Again, remember, and I understand that I'm asking for a lot, but, but if you remember from chemistry, cis trans, so the double bonds, cannot normally isomerize. That's why we have cis and trans isomers. They can't just flip at any point, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have these isomers, right? If, they could, if the double bonds just could flip around, we, there would be no difference between cis and trans, right? So normally, they cannot flip. But if we excite the system of double bonds, they, they can flip, and they do. Because in fact, this 11 cis retinol is slightly less thermodynamically stable than the old trans version. So when, it ex when it's excited, it has a tendency to flip. So old trans is more stable, okay? Not by a huge amount, but it's more stable. Yes, it only flips the, I mean, in theory, it could flip any of them but the highest probability is that the 11 cis flips to trans, okay? That's about 67% probability that it actually, about two thirds probability that it flips the, uh, the 11 cis. So what we get from it is, the, let's say the normal all trans version. Hopefully I drew the carbons right, but you can imagine that. All right? So this is what happens when 11 cis retinol inside rhodopsin or photopsin, it works exactly the same way in rods and cones. When it absorbs light, it flips the, uh, the double bond and becomes all trans retinol. Now as you can see already from the structures, this change causes a massive change in the shape of the molecule. Okay, so it was bent like this, and then it straightens up. 
And since it's hidden inside the protein, the result of that is a conformational change in the whole protein. So the same way as in G-protein coupled, other G-protein coupled receptors, when let's say glutamate or adrenaline comes and binds to the receptor, it causes conformational change. Here we don't need any external ligand, we just need the isomerization of 11 cis retinol to all trans retinol to cause the conformational change. This molecule is just retinol? That's all trans retinol. You could just say retinol, but in this context it's probably good to use the all trans uh, uh, yeah, classification. Does it make sense? Right, so now the G protein coupled receptor called rhodopsin or photopsin is activated and it works exactly the same way as all other G protein coupled receptors. So it activates a G protein, right? Okay, now I'm sure you all know what happens there. So the inactive G protein is composed of three subunits, alpha, beta, gamma, yep, okay. Now when it becomes activated, the alpha subunit, it does dissociate, but before it dissociates, it's a G protein. GTP, it's G protein, right, okay. Uh, so it exchanges its GDP for GTP, and then it dissociates, okay. And the alpha subunit and the beta, gamma subunit can activate other things. So, the G protein in this case is called transducin. And again, it was the first G protein discovered, okay? So all the classification afterwards came afterwards, okay? So this, this one is called transducin, and it still is, and it's denoted as GT, okay? Becomes activated, and the alpha subunit activates an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase. What does phosphodiesterase do? It breaks down not just CMP, CGMP, all the cyclic nucleotides, right? It breaks them down to the normal monophosphate nucleotides. Yeah, is that something that rings a bell? <clears throat> Good. So in this case, it's not CAMP that we're interested in. It could be, but it isn't. This phosphodiesterase is specific for CGMP, and it breaks down CGMP to GMP. And here we come to the crucial bit of the signaling this decrease in CGMP concentration causes the closure of sodium channels. I'll repeat that. So. So in both rods and cones, there are CGMP sensitive sodium channels in the membrane. Okay? In the membrane, there are many, 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 many sodium channels that are sensitive to CGMP. Okay? So when CGMP is present, they're open. Now, what happens if we have sodium channels open in a cell? Depolarization. So, and this is different to all other cells in the body. Rods and cones are all the time depolarized. Their normal state in the dark is depolarized. They are constantly depolarized, okay? With all other sensory cells, they only depolarize when a stimulus comes, okay? Here, it's the other way around. They are depolarized all the time. And in fact, when the stimulus comes through this cascade, they hyperpolarize or repolarize. I'll say that again because this is the crucial part of the function, okay? So rods and cones are in the dark, they are depolarized, and when the light comes through this mechanism, transducin, phosphodiesterase, decreasing CGMP, their sodium channels close and they repolarize. <clears throat> 
All right? Now, this whole thing is not the end of the signaling because, of course, we also need to go back to the initial state. Okay, so now we've activated the rod and cone. Activated, but actually deactivated, if you know what I mean. Okay, it's, it's a bit weird, but that's how it works. Um, but we have to go back to the, to the original state. Yes? I'll, I'll get to that in a second, okay? How the, how the signal is propagated further. But let's first talk about how we can stop this whole thing, how we can go back to the original state, okay? So the first thing that happens is that the activated rhodopsin or photopsin is very quickly inactivated, okay? It's inactivated the same way as other G protein coupled, coupled receptors are inactivated. There is a special kinase called G-protein receptor kinase, which is present for all G-protein coupled receptors. I mean, we didn't really talk about it very much. We mentioned it very briefly last year. But all G-protein coupled receptors are very quickly inactivated, desensitized, when we talk about desensitization. They're all desensitized through the action of this G-protein coupled receptor kinase, which phosphorylates the receptor. And the phosphorylated receptor is then increases its affinity for a protein called arrestin. So the, the, G, the activated G protein coupled receptor becomes, uh, becomes phosphorylated and binds arrestin, which stops the, uh, the activation of the receptor. It can no longer activate any G proteins. Again, this is a mechanism that's the same for all G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so that's the first thing that stops the, the, the molecule, the activated molecule, from further activating further G proteins, okay? That's fairly important. So when the rest of the binds, it goes back to No, I'll, I'll get to that now, all right? So now we've stopped the receptor from signaling, from signaling any further, from activating any further G protein coupled receptors. However, we still have the retinol in its, uh, in its all trans form. So we have to return it back to the 11 cis. Now, in, uh, in vertebrates, in insects and cephalopods, etc., this occurs inside the protein. So the, the, their rhodopsin is basically just capable of flipping it back to the original form. In our retinas, that's not possible. There's actually, <laughs> unfortunately, a fairly complicated process that needs to occur. So, after 11 cis retinal changes to all trans, the conformation changes and actually leads to the hydrolysis of this bond, and the all trans retinal is released from the protein, from rhodopsin or photopsin. It actually leaves the protein. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So after the isomerization, after a while, it takes a few seconds to a few minutes, this all trans retinal spontaneously hydrolyzes. It re it's released from the protein, okay? Which bleaches the protein. The protein is no longer colored, okay? It, lo it loses its colored bit. So actually, in research, you can easily see the bleached parts that don't have it. And this all trans retinal is then reduced to retinol, to all trans retinol. Okay, so it leaves the protein and it's reduced to all trans retinol. Does it, go completely out of it will, it will, it will, not yet. No. Okay, now this all trans retinol then can be isomerized back to its 11 cis, but that actually doesn't occur inside the rod and cone, it occurs in the cells that surround them. And those are the cells of the pigmented epithelium. Okay, they are behind the, the rods and cones. So the all trans retinol comes into the, uh, the pigmented epithelium. There it becomes isomerized to 11 cis retinol and then it's imported back into the rod or cone and then changed to retinol and then put back into the, uh, the rhodopsin or photopsin. Does 
So once again, the old transretinol leaves the, the photoreceptor for the pigmented epithelium. It's isomerized to 11 cis. Very interesting, very strange chemistry there. Um, very precise chemistry. Um, and then it's imported back into the photoreceptor, changed to, uh, to 11 cis retinol, and put back into the, uh, into the photoreceptor protein. It goes back to the rod and goes back into the molecule where it left. Well, not the exact one, but. OK. Now, this is true for both rods and cones, that the pigmented epithelium is the site of the isomerization. But for cones, it appears that they are actually capable of using other cells for the recycling. And these would be the glial cells in the retina called Mueller cells. OK? So for cones, they can also use Mueller cells, but they also use the pigmented epithelium. Right? Make sense? No, the oxidation occurs in the photoreceptor. Okay, so they export retinol, okay, and then it's then it's oxidized by, uh, yeah, retinol oxidase or dehydrogenase. I think. All right, the final bit for retina is how this signal, this weird hyperpolarization signal, very very strange, how it's propagated through the retina and then into the brain. Well, as you know, the photoreceptors are connected to another type of cells, which are nerve cells, called bipolar cells. Okay, That's why they look bipolar. Okay, There are other cells, of course. There are some interneurons there, but we don't really need to, need to talk about them. So the bipolar cell is the receiving, the cell that receives the signal from the, uh, from the rod or cone. Now, how does it work? Well, in the dark, when the rod or cone is depolarized, it constantly releases a neurotransmitter. And the neurotransmitter is glutamate. So it just keeps releasing glutamate. The rods and cones or the bipolar cells? The rods and cones release glutamate as their neurotransmitter. OK? When light comes in, activates this whole thing, the cell becomes, the rod and cone becomes, uh, becomes repolarized, and they stop releasing glutamate which kind of makes sense, right? That's the same as, as in any other cell. Now, how is the signal propagated further? Well, in fact, we have two different kinds of bipolar cells, functionally, two different kinds of bipolar cells in the retina. They are called on cells and off cells. The on bipolar cells become excited when there is light. Okay, and this is something that's important kind of to, you know, to think about it because it's a little bit counterintuitive. So the on cells are called on because when we shine light onto, on the photoreceptor, they become activated. The off bipolar cells become inactivated when we shine light. Okay, so far it kind of makes sense. Okay, on cells become on when light is present, off cells become off when light, light is present. But how does it work with this glutamate being not released anymore that we can have some cells deactivating and some cells activating? Does it make sense what I'm getting at? So what do you think? How is that possible that we can have bipolar cells that become off, that become inactivated, and we can have some cells that become activated. The only thing that changes is that glutamate stops being released. Yeah, there'll be, there'll be a break soon, but let's, let's think about this. Maybe for on cells, there's a nerve pathway with the GABA, and it stops. Um... It's all done by glutamate. There's no other neuro, well, there are other neurotransmitters in the interneurons, but, but here it's, it's just glutamate. 
Here, it's only glutamate. They all, they all only see glutamate. That's not important. What happens then is not really important. Then it goes to ganglionic cells. But, but here, some cells become, become excited and some cells become inhibited. How is that possible? They react completely differently to the same signal, which means, which is basically just no more glutamate. Different what proteins? Okay, we're getting to the answer. Well, the on cells and the off cells have different glutamate receptors on them. What kind of receptors would there be? So for the off cells, that's, e that's relatively easy. So what kind of glutamate-ergic receptors would there be? I don't need the name, but what type of glutamate-ergic receptor would there be for an off cell? A cell that when, sorry, a cell that when no more glutamate is released, becomes inactivated. Yeah, the normal ionotropic excitatory receptors. Okay, I think they have AMPA receptors here, but that's not really that important. Okay? So these would be the normal excitatory glutamatergic receptors. Just pay attention if, if you can, but just stop writing, okay? So when glutamate is released in the dark, these cells are excited all the time. They are excited all the time, right? When glutamate release stops in the light, they become inactivated, right? Make sense? How is it gonna be in the on cells? Well, there's gonna be inhibitory metabotropic receptors, which in this case are inhibitory. So in the dark, these cells are continuously inhibited by the glutamate. And when the glutamate release stops, they become excited. Does it make sense? It's a little bit counterintuitive because it works differently from all the other sensory cells. But hopefully it makes sense. All right? So we have these two types of cells. And they actually serve, they, they are the first processing unit because they are connected and interconnected. And they're the first processing unit in the retina which, which allows basically us to detect individual points of light and not kind of fuzzy disks of light, okay? But I won't go into the processing. I think you'll deal with that in, or you have done maybe already in physiology, okay? So, <clears throat> so I'm not gonna go into details, but these on-off cells are very, very important for the, for the signaling. The final bit, then the signal goes to ganglionic cells and you know, into the brain for, for further processing. What was discovered quite recently, and it's very interesting, is that we actually have a third type of photosensitive cells in the retina. Okay? This was discovered, I think, five or six years ago. Um, some of the ganglionic cells have a different kind of, kind of light-sensing protein called melanopsin. Now this was discovered because people noticed that patients with complete retinal degeneration, so patients that don't have any rods and cones, are still capable of synchronizing their circadian rhythms. So their rhythms were still synchronized with day and night. Okay? And people are asking, well, how is that possible? I mean, they're unable to detect any light. And that's how they discovered that as I said, some ganglionic cells contain another type of photosensitive protein called melanopsin. And this melanopsin is very different from rhodopsin and photopsin. It's actually very close to the photosensing pigments of invertebrates, of insects and cephalopods, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? It is something that we call a bistable pigment. So when I told you that in rhodopsin and photopsin, we are unable to flip this back to 11 cis. In melanopsin, we can. So melanopsin does not need any weird cycle for recycling ultra, uh, 11 cis to all trans, et cetera, et cetera. But in melanopsin, basically, first photon that comes, 
flips it from 11 cis to all trans, the next photon that comes flips it back to the original state. So it is what we call a bistable pigment. Here, the retinol does not leave the protein. It just stays there all the time. Okay, a very interesting discovery. So we still have bits of invertebrates in us. No, 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 no. This is in invertebrates. Invertebrates. So insects and all the other stuff. All vertebrates have this process. Okay. And yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah. No, 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 no. All the invertebrates. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't say that we have bad vision at night. I think it's reasonably good. Okay. But there are actually other mechanisms that make other animals more sensitive to light at night. So for example, you probably will know that with cats, when you shine light, okay, you can see their eyes, okay, because they actually have a reflective layer behind the retina, which reflects light back in and then makes them more sensitive, and we don't have that. Okay? So it's not so much about the rods and cones and mechanisms behind it, but it's more how the eye is put together, which makes them... Yeah, no, 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 this is for invertebrates, okay? Like flies and stuff. Yes, yes, but here it can flip back inside the protein. All right, um, any questions? We took a little longer <laughs> with vision than I thought, but yeah. I'm not surprised, yeah. It's, it's, it's difficult. Yes. And if there's like no glutamate. Correct. Okay. But now when there's no glutamate, the on and off cells are not working either. Well, no, 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 no. The off, when there's no more glutamate, yeah. the off cell shuts off. Okay? Because it has ionotropic excitatory receptors, so it just shuts off. It stops being activated. For the on cell, it works the other way around. Because it was actually all the time inhibited through amgluors, it was inhibited by glutamate. And when we take away the inhibition, they can, these cells can spontaneously excite themselves and, and send a signal. Cool. All right. Okay. Um, we could have 10 lectures on this. There are very, very interesting amplification steps and what makes it so sensitive and, and the dynamic range, et cetera, et cetera, but we don't really have time for that. All right, so let's take a two or three minute break, just very, very brief break, and we'll continue with, yeah, I know it's short, but we took a lot longer, and then we'll talk about uh, smell. Okay. All right, let's move on uh, to the next sense, the, me the next best studied sense of all the senses, which is smell, which is olfaction. Once again, the reason why it's relatively well studied is that it's fairly nicely accessible and all the receptors are in one place. And where is that place? Yeah, it's the olfactory epithelium at the top of the nasal cavity, right? All the, all the odor receptors are there. Now, uh, the odor receptors, well, what are the, what type of cells detect smells? Okay, so there are special types of neurons that are actually inside the epithelium, right? They're surrounded by epi epithelial cells, but they're actually neurons, and their axons, so we have sort of bipolar neurons, we have some ending here in the mucus, there are epithelial cells around it, and the axons of the bipolar neurons go where? Yeah, is that something that rings a bell? They go to the olfactory bulb, and they have to go through cribriform plate. Very good, right? So they go into the olfactory bulb, where they connect to some mitral cells, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, something that you know. Good. So, how does it work on the molecular level? Well, this is actually relatively easy. Definitely much easier than the retina. Here. In these olfactory neurons, we have olfactory receptors, ORs, which are G protein coupled receptors. That's like the cilia coming from the... It's on the cilia. Yeah. 
Okay, so it's in the membrane. They're just normal membrane G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so here we are with a chemical sense. It just detects a ligand that binds to the, uh, to the OR. Now, when we talked about uh, adrenergic receptors, we said that there are five types, two alpha receptors and three beta receptors. For olfactory receptors, we have about 400 different receptors. So in our genome, there are about 400 functional genes for olfactory receptors. So in fact, olfactory receptors are the largest family of G-protein coupled receptors in our body. Okay, so around 400 functional ones. Okay, mice and dogs have over 1,000. We have about 400 of them. What is really interesting and really poorly studied is that each olfactory neuron only expresses one type of olfactory receptor. Okay, so in the genome we have 400 of them, but at random, each receptor chooses one gene to express, and all the other ones are not expressed. Furthermore, each receptor only picks one allele for this gene. So with all the genes, we have two copies, right? Two alleles for all of them in all our cells. Here, the olfactory neurons never express both alleles for one of the 400 genes, but they only pick one. Again, this is very, very unusual for any cell to pick just one allele to express, but this is what happens in these olfactory neurons. It makes sense, because if we have two different alleles, it's possible that they would be detecting slightly different odors, and we would get a mess in the, in, in the perception, right? So here the olfactory neurons only pick one allele of one olfactory receptor and express that, okay? What is even more fascinating and again, nobody knows how that works, is these, uh, the, the, the neurons that express a specific allele of a specific olfactory receptor are spread around the epithelium. They're not in one place. They're spread around the epithelium. However, their axons all come together in the olfactory bulb and connect to the same mitral cells. Okay, so all the, the, so the receptor, sorry, the neuron chooses an allele at random. But then it finds its way to the same place in the olfactory bulb so that all the neurons with the same allele are connected to the same one. Nobody knows how that works. Okay, how do, how do they find their way in the correct place? Nobody knows that. It's really interesting, okay. Why is it even more interesting? Well you may know that the olfactory neurons are one of the few neurons that can actually regenerate, okay? If we damage the olfactory epithelium and we don't destroy it completely, usually these neurons are capable of regenerating. So when a new neuron comes in or grows in, it still finds it wet its way to the correct place in the olfactory bulb so that it connects to the same mitral cells, okay? Again, the mechanism is still unknown and it's very interesting. Sorry? The olfactory neurons, yes. Yeah. Okay? So, very strange thing. Anyway, we have about 400 genes, and uh, each of these genes, or each of the proteins that are coded by these genes, detects a certain range of chemicals. Okay? So, if we're talking about smells, we're talking about volatile chemicals that come into the, into the nasal cavity, okay? All sorts of organic molecules. And each of these receptors usually detects many of them. So it's not specific to just one compound, but actually can detect a range of compounds, okay? So we have 400 different receptors, and including alleles, we would have 800 different proteins, okay? Somewhere in the epithelium. Each of them detects many molecules, and these molecules, the molecular ranges overlap between those, those proteins. And the brain somehow is capable from this massive matrix of information is capable of forming specific smells that we can actually detect, okay? 
The processing itself, again, is relatively poorly understood. It's very, very complex. It involves, for example, time. So when we smell something, uh, of course, here we have a layer of mucus. So the, the, the rate of diffusion of the molecule into the mucus actually is part of the sensing. So when you smell a rose or whatever, the, the volatile molecules, the small molecules, come into the nose and they start diffusing into the mucus at different rates. And this changes basically the times when they are detected. And the brain is capable of putting all this information together and say, oh, okay, this is this and this is that, and put all together, this is the smell of the rose. Okay, very complex. Last thing I'll, well, two last things. Uh, the, when you look at most textbooks, it will say that human smell is relatively poor compared to some other mammals, let's say, like mice and dogs, okay? Usually in textbooks they say that we can detect about 10,000, or that we can distinguish between 10,000 different smells. That's probably not true. In fact, latest research shows that human smell is as good as the smell of dogs and mice and some other, uh, some other uh, vertebrates, some other mammals. Um, but what is different is that we are much more sensitive to some smells and less sensitive to other smells, while mice are more sensitive to some smells and less sensitive to other smells. So we are, for example, very good at detecting various smells of food and wine and flowers, for example, uh, but we are actually bad at detecting some other smells that, for example, the mice are, are good at. So the latest estimates uh, are that we can, we can in theory, distinguish between a trillion different smells, which is absolutely incredible. And as I said, there were, there were actually experiments done where for some chemicals we are much more sensitive than mice, and mice and dogs are more sensitive to some other ones. So it appears that this dogma um, that human smell is relatively poor seems to be incorrect, that our smell is actually very good. But of course, <clears throat> living in um, cities, etc., we probably don't know how to distinguish between the smells because we're not trained in that because we don't need it. Um, but the, our, the capability is probably there, that we could, we could actually be very, very good um, at, yeah, at smelling things. Now, I said that these are G-protein coupled receptors. The G-protein here is the standard GS protein, which activates adenylate cyclase and increases CMP. And this CMP then opens cyclic AMP dependent sodium channels and causes depolarization of those neurons, which is then carried into the olfactory bulb, etc. So here the cascade is actually fairly straightforward. There is, however, one very interesting thing about olfactory neurons. The CAMP, not directly but indirectly, opens also chloride channels. Now, when we open chloride channels in a normal cell, what happens? There is hyper or repolarization, right? Here, it causes depolarization. How is that possible? Correct. Olfactory neurons have a higher concentration of chloride ions than the mucus in which they are embedded. So when we open chloride, chloride channels, chloride ions actually start leaking out of the cell and cause depolarization. In normal cells, it's the other way around, right? In normal neurons, there is actually more outside and less inside, so chloride, go in, chloride ions go in um, and we get repolarization. Here is the other way around. So here, the opening of chloride channels causes depolarization, okay? Because there's a, a different uh, gradient. The GS protein in olfactory cells is sometimes denoted as g -olf, okay? But it's a GS protein, basically. All right. Any questions about, yes? Uh, 
I said quite a few things about that. Right, um, that the, the coding or decoding of the smell is not just dependent on which receptors are activated, but also on when they are activated, okay? So the diffusion of those smells through the mucus also determines how quickly they are detected, and, this, and the brain uses that also as a part of the information, okay? <coughs> yeah, as I say, it's, it's incredibly complex smell, uh, sorry, sense. Uh, it's very, very interesting. All right. Again, we could have several lectures just on the sense of smell. And as I said, it's fascinating and still some things are poorly understood, but we have to move on. Um, the next sense is also a chemical sense, and it's the sense of taste. What are the, what is the organ of taste? Where? Hmm? Okay. It's the it's taste buds, and where do we have them? On the tongue. On the tongue. And the, tongue. And the soft palate. Yeah, the, the tongue and soft palate. And the taste buds are usually on the tongue. They are part of structures called. Usually it's valate papillae, but some, some other fungiform may have some of them as well. But let's say valate papillae are the main site where taste buds are. Now, taste buds are composed of many different sensing cells. They're not neurons, but they are, they are sensory cells. And these sensory cells, of course, as with other senses, have receptors, more or less specific receptors for taste. Now, what different kinds of tastes do we have? So we have salty, sweet, bitter, umami, and sour, okay? So these are the, the normal five senses. Further research is suggesting that there are actually more types of taste than these five, okay? There is there's some evidence that we might be able to detect fatty taste, that fatty could be a sixth taste, okay? It's probably the taste of fatty acids, okay? So still the receptor is not quite clear, but it appears to be one. There may be a metallic taste, is another type of taste, okay? So when you put something metallic in your mouth, it has a specific taste, yeah, maybe another one. But let's stay with the five tastes, because as we'll see, even with these five tastes, there are some where the specific mechanism is still unclear. So let's start with the ones with the types of taste where we know the mechanism of sensation. And those are sweet, umami, and bitter. So these three, we know very well how they are detected. They are all detected by G-protein coupled receptors. By the way, umami, what is, what is, what produces umami taste? It's glutamate, but yeah, stuff that contains a lot of amino acids because it's not just glutamate, but other amino acids are also capable of inducing this, uh, this taste. And there are some other chemicals. When you look at um, some of these instant noodles, you'll find a lot of other chemicals that actually are agonists on these receptors, and they produce umami taste, even though they're not glutamate. Uh, but glutamate is the, is the usual main one that produces umami taste. All right. So uh, for sweet umami and bitter, we have fairly well characterized G-protein coupled receptors that belong to the group of taste receptors. taste receptors. For bitter taste, I'll start from the end, for bitter taste, we have T2 receptors. T2 receptors. Taste receptors, yeah. So for bitter taste, we have T2 receptors, and uh, we have approximately 40, just over 40 different kinds of T2 receptors for bitter stuff. Okay, here you can see how from an evolutionary point of view, how important it was to detect bitter stuff because bitter stuff usually meant that something is poisonous, something is bad for us, okay? So we have 40 different genes for bitter chemicals, okay? So we can, we can detect a lot of different chemicals that taste bitter, you know, don't eat it. So T2, T2 receptors are for bitter stuff. 
for sweet and umami, we have T1 receptors. T1R. And these T1 receptors have three subtypes. Okay, one, two, and three. Now, for sweet and umami taste, we have heterodimers of two different kinds of T1 receptors. So we have T1 receptors, there are three members of T1 receptors, and they always exist as heterodimer. So two different T1 receptors have to be put together to form a functional taste receptor, okay? For the um, sweet taste, we have T1R2 plus three, and for the umami taste, we have T1R1 plus three. Does it make sense? So there are three different types of T1 receptors, but they only exist as dimers, as heterodimers. So always two of them have to be put together. Okay? So when we put together two plus three, we have a sweet receptor, and when we put together one plus three, we have umami receptor. Now, uh, all these receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, the G-protein is usually denoted as G gustatory or gust ducin. Gust ducin. The idea behind it is like like transducin, but here it's gustatory, so gust ducin. However, its signaling cascade is still poorly understood. So you will find papers that say that it increases CAMP, you'll find uh, papers where it shows that it decreases CAMP, you'll find papers where they say that it increases uh, uh, phospholipase C and IP3. So the cascade is unclear, okay? And it appears, for some of the receptors, like sweet receptors, it appears that depending on the ligand, you get different kind of signaling, which is strange. But for example, for sugars, you get one type of signaling, and for artificial sweeteners, you get a different kind of signaling. Okay, strange, but so anyway. So I won't really go into, uh, into the, the cascade itself. However, what I will mention is that these sensory cells containing these receptors, of course, have to signal to the neurons that then go into the brain so, so they can detect taste. And this signaling is done by a relatively unusual neurotransmitter. It is a neurotransmitter, but it's not that usual, and that's ATP. So these cells, these sensory cells, release ATP. It's not even clear how they release it. They don't seem to have any vesicles with ATP, okay? So it's not like a synapse signaling. It's still a little bit unclear how they do it. But they release ATP. And on the, on the neuron, there are ATP receptors, okay, purinergic receptors, which activate the neuron further. Okay, so it's, it's a very strange, unusual neurotransmitter coupling. Now, I've left out the two other tastes. Well, not left out, but I left, it, I left them for the end, um, because these two are still relatively poorly understood. For the uh, salty taste, which is basically taste of cations, of small cations, okay, so sodium mostly, but potassium also tastes sort of salty, okay, lithium tastes a little bit salty, okay, so all these small alkaline metals taste about the same. The receptor, the, the most likely uh, candidate for the receptor is an ion channel, called ENAC, which stands for epithelial sodium channel. There are actually many different types of ENACs, but one of them is probably the detector of the salty taste. 
the logic behind it is obvious. When we put something, when we put sodium, something containing sodium on our t uh, on the um, the taste buds on our tongue, it it basically increases the flow through this through this channel and depolarizes the cell. Okay, but as I said, there's still a big debate about whether ENAC or which specific ENAC it is. So let's just leave it that it's an ion channel, probably from the ENAC family. For the sour taste, it's even less understood. Okay, so most likely it is also an ion channel which somehow detects the proton gradient. Okay, pH basically, proton gradient. Okay. The, in the latest literature, I think the, the channel, the candidate channel was called PKD, which stands for polycystic kidney disease, because it's the protein that's mutated in polycystic uh, kidney disease. It's, it's, an, it's a channel, it's an ion channel. But it's not 100% sure that PKD is the one. In fact, there is some evidence that in the detecting of sour taste, we're actually detecting intracellular protons. So the sour stuff first has to get inside the cell, so it's not detecting outside, but it, it has to get inside the cell, and then we perceive sour taste. This would explain why organic uh, acids taste more sour at the same concentration than mineral acids. So if we have the same concentration of acetic acid, for example, or lactic acid, and the same concentration of hydrochloric acid, Okay, well, I mean, same concentration, meaning the same pH. It's not the same concentration, but the same pH. Uh, the acetic acid will taste more sour than the hydrochloric acid. And the reason behind it, at least the hypothesis, is that first the acid has to go inside the cell, which is easier for organic acids than for mineral acids. But who knows? All right, so PKD might be the channel. Let's just remember that it's an ion channel detecting protons, but who knows what it, what it actually is. Well, it could be one of these, okay? But as I say, they've, they've done a lot of knockout experiments and it still seems unclear, okay? So they've knocked out a lot of genes in mice and the mice were still perfectly capable of detecting sour taste, so who knows, All right? Okay, um, now, as I said, there are probably other kinds of tastes, we'll see in the future. But also, many of these chemoreceptors, which we would categorize as taste receptors, are all over our body. So the whole digestive tract, for example, has a lot of receptors for various nutrients, for glucose, for fatty acids, for amino acids, which serve for the regulation of the function of the digestive tract, okay? So for the regulation of glycemia, you know that glucose is detected by the digestive tract. And what is the signaling? There's a signal from the digestive tract that increases insulin secretion. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Now we call it glucagon-like peptide, GLP. Okay. In cretins, yeah. There are some, anyway. Uh, the digestive tract has a lot of various nutrient sensing uh, sensors which are used basically to excrete some other signaling molecules into the body to prepare the body for digestion, for signaling, etc. So when we talk about the senses sensing the external world, these are the ones, but we could again have another couple lectures on the various other nutrient sensors in the body, okay? There are glucose sensors in the brain that detect how much glucose we have, etc., etc. okay? Good. The final part of the lecture will deal with uh, the rest of the physical senses, meaning mechanoreception and heat and cold reception. Now, as you can see, the pattern in the lecture is that we're going from the, from the senses that are really, really well studied to the senses where we know almost nothing about them. So mechanoreception is one of the ones where we know actually very, very little how these mechanoreceptors work. Well, we know how they work, but we don't know exactly which proteins are involved. In mechanoreception, it's actually the, the basic principle of mechanoreception is very simple. What happens is that usually we have an ion channel that opens when any kind of pressure is applied to it. Okay, that's the basic principle for all mechanoreception. 
And when I say mechanoreception, hearing is also a mechanoreceptor. Okay, because in hearing, what we have is the vibrations that put pressure or put strain on the hair cells in the inner ear. So touch, proprioception, hearing are all basically the same type of receptor. Right? So the, the general mechanism is that we have an ion channel usually connected to the cytoskeleton. And when we push or pull or distort the membrane, the channel opens and activates the cell. Okay, these are cation channels, so when they open, usually sodium goes in and activates the cell. So this is the general mechanism in all of them. Okay? There are specifics that differ for different kinds of cells that have these. Okay? So for example, in the, um, both in hair cells and in the, um, uh, in the organ for equilibrium, uh, the, the hairs, the stereocilia that are there, are actually, actually capable of detecting whether the, the endolymph or whatever is, is moving this way or that way because it opens, there are actually tethers between the stereocilia and they open different channels depending on whether they deflect this way or that way, okay? But again, the general mechanism behind it is the same. It's just an iron channel that if you pull on it or if you push on it, it just opens. One of the prototypical ion channels, uh, sorry, mechanoreceptors, is the osmo, are the osmoreceptors, which are again all over the body in the brain in the hypothalamus, where they detect the composition of the blood, etc. Here, they work very simply by the fact that when osmotic pressure changes, the cell either swells or shrinks. If it swells, it opens the channel. If it shrinks, it closes the channel, very simply, just by pulling on it, pulling on the membrane, okay? So osmoreceptors, again, work the same way, only here the pressure does not come from the outside, but actually comes from the changes of the shape of the cell, okay? We have receptors of something called shear stress. Shear stress just means how quickly, usually, how quickly a fluid flows over an epithelium or endothelium, okay? So the endothelium can detect how quickly blood flows, and again, it's, caused, it's the mechanism behind it is that, that there is a force that is being put on, on, on these receptors. Uh, yeah, we could talk about all the various candidate uh, ion channels. Many of them belong to this ENAC group, ENAC family, so epithelial sodium channels, many, many different members. But again, the exact uh, identity of them is not clear. The latest research shows that for touch, um, the, the most likely channels are called piezo channels. This is just for your interest. Okay. All sorts of different channels, many different candidates. And now we're going to talk about temperature. All right. So the temperature changes, they are actually, I left them to the end, but they're actually really, really well studied and we know how they work. Um, for temperature changes, we have two receptors, two proteins, one for heat, so higher temperature, and the other one for cold, so lower temperature. And they are all, they both belong to the same superfamily of receptors. They are ion channels. And they are called TRP, which stands for transient receptor potential. They're called TRPV and TRPM. So TRPV is for heat, and TRPM, specifically TRPM8, but that's not that important, is for cold. Now how do they work? Well, they're both ion channels, cation channels, in fact. Um, and TRPV, so the one for heat, basically opens when temperature increases and closes when it decreases. TRPM, on the other hand, opens when the temperature decreases and closes when, when it increases. Does it make sense? Well, so TRPV is the heat sensor, so it opens when the when temperature goes up. Okay? TRPM opens when temperature goes down. Are they're iron channels, they're cation channels, yes. The mystery behind it is, well, how does that work? How can an ion channel detect changes in temperature? Well, it's, not, it's still not 100% uh, 
clear, but it appears that the reason is that these channels use what's basically called a thermal motion. Okay? So when you have a protein molecule, it has a certain structure. And as the temperature increases, the structure becomes more and more disordered. Okay? In the end, the protein becomes denatured when we increase the temperature too much. And this is probably what these ion channels use to detect the changes in temperature. They, the, the TRPV channels probably have a domain which in lower temperatures basically has a structure that blocks the channel. So part of the protein blocks the channel. But as the temperature increases, this relatively poorly structured domain starts moving more and more around and actually starts opening, allowing the, the channel to open. Okay, so this is probably the mechanism for TRPV channels. For TRPM, it's basically the other way around. So for TRPM, we have a domain which when it moves around, it blocks the channel. And when the temperature decreases, it kind of gets stuck in a certain position, which opens the channel. Okay, so it's really just about having a relatively poorly structured part of the protein which either blocks or opens the channel when the temperature increases. The, yeah, for, for both of these channels, we have, which is quite interesting, we have artificial ligands that can open them regardless of temperature. And you probably know what they are. Do you know what opens the TRPV, the heat channels? Yeah, capsaicin. Capsaicin, which is the, co the, the hot compound in chilies, in chili peppers, okay? There are some other compounds which do the same thing. So the stuff in pepper is, in, in black pepper, is actually a different one, it's not capsaicin. But capsaicin is the stuff in chilies, and it's an artificial ligand for TRPV receptors. In fact, the V stands for vanilloid, because capsaicin is a vanilloid compound. You don't have to know that, but it's just a connection to, to that. So the artificial ligand is capsaicin. So the, the sensation of heat that we get from eating chilies is an actual sensation of heat. It's the same channels, only it's not really heat, but it's, yeah. Um, we also have artificial ligands for the cold receptors. Does anyone know what? Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> But that's actually cold. <laughs> so something that's not cold, but feels like cold. Menthol. menthol, yes. So menthol, which is in mint and some other stuff, opens artificially the TRPM channels. The M doesn't stand for menthol, but you can use it as a, as a mnemonic. It doesn't actually stand for it, but it doesn't matter. All right, so menthol is an artificial ligand for TRPM. It produces the sensation of cold by activating the cold receptors artificially. All right. Any questions? Yes. You know, it's already kind of like now, but I have a question. Like, nowadays you have a lot of research going into Roma organ and Into? Animals. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, how would that work here? Yeah. Um, so in addition to these OR receptors, there also exist VR receptors, which in most mammals, most vertebrates are part, are expressed in the vomeronasal organ. We don't have that. We don't have a functional vomeronasal organ, okay? But it appears that these VR receptors are expressed in some of the normal olfactory neurons, okay? So we do have functional pheromone, whatever, VR receptors, which probably work and, f and which do connect to the, uh, the correct places in the, in the brain. It's still an area that's relatively poorly studied, but from behavioral studies, it appears that humans do respond to pheromones and actually do change their behavior. So we do have these receptors. We don't have omeronasal organ, but we, have, do, we do have these receptors and they seem to be functional. Any other questions? Nope. All right, okay, well, that's all. Thank you.